So let's take a little bit deeper look into the membrane and in particular the membrane proteins of importance here. So when we look at the cell membrane, the cell membrane is made up of a phospholipid bilayer that has a polar or hydrophilic phosphatic head. That means it has a phosphate group within the uh, glycerol molecule or on the glycerol molecule that allows it to interact with water. And then it has a hydrophobic or a fatty acid tail to it. Connecting to the phosphatic heads, to the phosphate groups, is a specialized lipid known as a cholesterol. The cholesterol molecule will stabilize the phosphate heads around the hydrophobic fatty acid tails so that when the membrane itself changes its structure, as things come in and things go out of the membrane, as the membrane uh, changes based off of the cell changing its needing to change its shape. What the cholesterol molecules do is it stabilizes that cell membrane at all times so that we have this constant barrier in between the extracellular region and the intracellular region. Embedded into this membrane are a host of membrane proteins. The membrane proteins will fit into three distinct categories. One's referred to as the integral protein. The integral protein is going to be on the intracellular side, and it serves as an anchorage point to the other two types of proteins that we see. The extracellular protein markers. The extracellular protein markers indicated here as the glycoproteins. And then we have the transcellular or the transmembrane proteins. The transmembrane proteins are going to function either as an antigen marker, very similar to the glycoprotein, or will act as an adherin, like what we saw with the uh, cell membrane junctions, or it will act as a receptor. So when we look at these various types of membrane proteins, they're going to function in distinct fashions. Now, what to remember is that the cell membrane itself, even though we show it in this orientation, is constantly fluxing, it's, it's constantly changing its relative shape and orientation, and what's referred to as a fluid mosaic fashion. And what the intracellular proteins or the integral proteins do is it ensures that whatever changes happen intracellularly will also happen on the membrane itself so that the cell stays intact. The membrane proteins themselves will function either as an identification marker or an antigen. This is where a lot of textbooks give you poor terminology. Antigens are markers that indicate that the cell belongs to you, comes from a distinct lineage of cells, and is found in a distinct organ within the body. Most textbooks will tell you that antigens are things that are going to trigger immune responses. While technically that is true, the antigens themselves are nothing more than cell markers. They're going to act as a gate. They're going to allow for things to come in and go out of the cell by acting as pores or by channels to allow things to move through the cell membrane itself. It will act as a receptor the receptor will have a distinct binding site that is a distinct structure within the protein itself that allows for other chemicals to interact with the protein. And then that will then trigger secondary changes within the cell itself. The last thing that we're going to see are the cytoskeletal or cytostructural supports. These are the cytoskeletal proteins, the microtubules, and the microfilaments that interact in between the cytoskeletal structures within the cytoplasm, within the cell itself, and with the membrane itself. Now within that classification of membranes, there are membrane receptors, there are two distinct types of membrane receptors that you should be aware of. They are referred to as the ionotropic and the metabotropic. Ionotropic receptors are going to allow for the opening of channels that allow for ions to move across. The movement of ions will alter membrane potentials. If we alter a membrane potential, we will alter the way in which a cell will function. The other type is what's referred to as the metabotropic receptor. And the metabotropic receptor 
is going to trigger what's referred to as secondary messenger pathways. These turn on or turn off enzymes by activating a membrane protein, usually referred to as a G-linked protein. That activation of the enzyme triggers a biochemical cascade of events, which alters the metabolism of the cell, which will then alter the function of the cell. One of the things that the cell membrane is responsible for doing is creating a barrier for materials to come in and go out from the cell, a topic that we usually refer to as membrane transportation. Membrane transportation is going to function with the membrane receptors and with the integrated membrane proteins to establish what's referred to as membrane dynamics. And so when we look at movement of materials across the membrane, we classify it based off of being either a passive activity or a facilitated and active. In a passive transportation, we are always moving from an area of highest concentration to an area of lowest concentration and is energy independent. These include things like osmosis and diffusion. Now we have to be careful with osmosis because even though osmosis is passive, water itself is hydrophilic and because the membrane itself is predominantly hydrophobic, it cannot pass directly through the membrane. It has to go through a secondary pore, the aquaporin. The facilitated transport is, can be energy independent. However, sometimes it is energy dependent. But just like with the passive transport, it's always going to move from highest concentration to lowest concentration. This will include things like diffusions taking place through gated channels and gated pores. This will include things like a symportation or an antiportation. Symportation is moving in the same direction. Antiportation is moving in the opposite direction. The last type of transportation is the active transportation. The active transportation is energy dependent, gradient independent. In active transport, I can be moving from low to high, or I can be moving from high to low. But in order to move, I have to expend energy. And this energy is in the conversion of ATP into ADP and phosphate, P. That conversion releases energy, and that energy can then be used by the cell to power up transporters. The most common of these will be the ion pumps that function within what we refer to as excitable tissues, muscle, either skeletal muscle or cardiac muscle or smooth muscle, and neurons. The ion pumps that we see here, the predominant of them happen to be the sodium potassium pump that are related to membrane potentiation. But we also have symportation and antiportation, again, coming from an active transportation. For large things and things that cannot easily get across the membrane, we have what is referred to as penocytosis and phagocytosis endocytotic movement. And the last act of transportation is not really due to functioning on the membrane itself, but due to movement of materials through the cytoskeletal proteins, and that is what's referred to as exocytosis. So why is it important to look at movement of materials across the membrane? Well, we're talking about movement of materials across the membrane. What we're really looking at is we're looking at how do we balance things across the membrane. And one of the most important things to balance across the membrane is the relationship between ions and water. What the balance of ion and water across the membrane does is it ensures things like normal membrane dynamics. That means that the membrane stays intact and the membrane functions normally. It provides for normal cell volumes. We'll look later on what happens when we don't have this correct balance. It allows for normal membrane potentials to be established and to be maintained. This Ability to maintain normal membrane potentials means that we're able to have normal cell functions. We see changes in almost all of these normals for the cells whenever we disrupt the balance of either ions or water across the membrane. One of the things you want to think about are things that might happen to yourself, to active people, to people who will be your patients when these balances become skewed when either I have not enough water and too many ions or not enough ions and too much water. 
on one side of the membrane or the other.